I call the National Assembly to order. The first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister, and the first question is from Lee Waters. So when will every child in Wales be taught how to code? Well, our programme for government sets out that we'll ensure young people in Wales have the relevant skills they need for the future by developing coding skills in our young people. And the Cabinet Secretary will be making an announcement as to how we're taking this forward in June. Thank you, First Minister. My daughter was nine yesterday, and for her birthday she asked for a, for a raspberry pie, which is uh, not a fruit-based pudding, but in fact, as you know, a small computer manufactured in, in your constituency. Uh, uh, no one... <laughs> In, in, in your area. Uh, now, when she, when she leaves uh, education, the ability to programme computers will be an essential skill, from everything to programming a manufacturing line to designing the next uh, innovation. But the Chief Inspector of Schools found that ICT standards are strong in only a very few schools and not enough understand the potential of digital learning to aid teaching uh, and learning. Teachers, uh, teaching our children to code should not rely on the enthusiasm of the odd teacher or on a parent's ability to buy a Raspberry Pi. It must be a key part of what our schools do or we'll be left behind. Now, the, as you indicate, the Donaldson curriculum will, of course, address this, but more than 150,000 young people will graduate the school system without this basic skill before that's fully implemented. So would you consider, First Minister, what interim measures you can put in place to ensure that every child in Wales gets the opportunity to learn computer coding as soon as possible? Well, can I begin, first of all, by wishing uh, the member's daughter a happy birthday for yesterday? She'll be a teenager soon. <laughs> uh, in answer to his question, we do know, of course, we want to encourage uh, coding skills. We fast-tracked the publication of the Digital Competence uh, Framework which will support the development and embedding of digital skills in everything a young person does in school. Many schools have already introduced coding skills into the classroom. We have invested 670,000 to the TechnoCamps and TechnoTeach programmes to deliver computer coding workshops to pupils and teachers in secondary schools in uh, Wales. And we've made a commitment to expand code clubs in every part of Wales. And that is before, of course, the announcement next month. Darren Miller. Josh Lewis. First Minister, we do need to be part of the coding revolution. It's important that our young people uh, learn these skills. But, of course, one of the problems that they've got is being able to do homework in relation to coding because there is inadequate access to the Superfast Cymru high-speed uh, broadband uh, scheme. You'll be aware that you made a clear commitment in your 2011 uh, Labour Assembly uh, manifesto which gave a pledge to roll out broadband to all residential premises and businesses by 2015. That was a broken promise, wasn't it? Don't you think, don't you think that it's about time you delivered on that promise and the others in that manifesto that you didn't keep? Well, our promise is to deliver to 96% of premises by the summer of this year. In contrast, his party, which made no promises at all when it came to, uh, to broadband and probably struggled with the very concept of what broadband is. Michelle Brown. Officer, if we have the money to be spending on IT, shouldn't that money be better? Wouldn't that money be better spent on lit literacy and numeracy in schools, which has been failing for a while? I, I see that uh, 1951 has dawned in the uh, corner over there. Well, of course, literacy and numeracy are important, uh, but so are IT skills. We know that for our young people, we know as members here that actually we couldn't function uh, properly in our jobs if we didn't have at least basic IT skills. And it's hugely important that our children have the same or if not better IT skills compared to other children in the world. Michelle, oh, just called that. A uh, question to Susie Davis. Uh, deal, Chloe. Uh, will the First Minister provide details of the oversight that Welsh Government has over debts owed to local authorities by third parties? Well, each local authority is responsible for the collection of its debts as part of its own effective financial management process. Well, I'm a bit disappointed with that answer, First Minister, as I thought you'd like to know what your local authorities are not recovering at a time when uh, they're claiming austerities and depriving them of any money. Um, I'm sure you'll join me in congratulating all the newly elected councillors yeah. at Bridgend County Borough Council, including the ten new Conservative yeah. members, yeah. and hopefully the new council will be able to reply to FOI requests within the statutory time limit so that I can ask questions like this with full information to hand. Can you tell me how, my, how much unclaimed debt is owed to local authorities, uh, the main sources of those debts, and the reasons that local authorities give you for not pursuing them? 
Uh, well, I can say that in 2015 to 16, uh, local authorities collected over 97 per cent of council tax billed, the highest level since this tax was introduced. Uh, maintaining full entitlement to support for all eligible applicants via our council tax reduction scheme has helped to mitigate rises in the level of council tax debt in Wales. And we know that council tax in Wales is far lower than in, uh, than in England under a Tory government there. Uh, and of course, uh, I can say to the member that um, collection rates in Wales are now at 97.2 per cent. They are lower in England. Heaven, David. I last saw Councillor Keith Reynolds, uh, leader of Philly County Borough Council, working at his desk. Um, some weeks before he died. Um, would the First Minister recognise that Welsh Labour's victory in Caerphilly, County Borough, is a testament to Keith's leadership, his sound financial management, and a lifetime in public service? Well, I mean, could I join the, uh, the member in uh, expressing my uh, regards, of course, to um, Councillor Keith Reynolds' uh, family? I know the illness was, uh, was short and, in many ways, uh, unexpected. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, people in Caerphilly would have uh, recognised the work that he and so many others did over the course of the last five years. Adam Price. Would the First Minister agree that the third party that, that owes the biggest debt of all to, to Welsh uh, local authorities is, is the Westminster Government that, that has cut uh, over a third in spending on adult care since 2011, which has had uh, severe financial consequences in Wales uh, uh, and uh, obviously terrible consequences in terms of the human cost to the elderly, uh, the sick and the disabled. If this callous Conservative government is re-elected, as seems increasingly uh, likely, on June the 8th, we need a plan to defend Wales. Where is it? What is it? Who's going to lead it? Because I have to say, on the evidence from yesterday, we are in a dire position if it's going to be him. Well, according to last week, it's him. <laughs> he, was, he was talking about the need for leadership. He was talking about uh, but himself. We will happily stand up for Wales. We don't want to see a future Conservative government walk all over Wales. And we have stood up for our people, as the election last year showed, and indeed in 2011. The reality is, and he is right to point out the cuts that have taken place, we have lost since 2010 the equivalent of the entire budget for health in the whole of North Wales. Despite that, we've maintained health spending at 1% above the level in England per head and maintained health and social care spending at 6% per head higher than in England, showing a Welsh Labour government delivering for the people of Wales in the face of Tory austerity. Now call on the party leaders to question the First Minister. Leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood. You launched your election campaign at yesterday, yeah, talking yeah. a lot about unity, but you couldn't bring yourself to utter the name of your leader. Is Jeremy Corbyn still your candidate for Prime Minister? Yes. Huh. First Minister, yesterday you had a chance to put Wales on the political landscape, but I'm instead, and I'm sure that Theresa May will be uh, breathing a huge sigh of relief, because three of your major pledges are devolved. And they were promises made yeah. ahead of last year's election. Yeah. And a fourth pledge on policing could have been devolved yeah, have if only Labour MPs hadn't had their own way. Now, the next few years will define the future of Wales and the UK. You should have made clear Welsh demands to give Wales a voice to defend Wales, but you failed to do that. Yeah. We'll now have to rely on Plaid Cymru MPs. OK, OK, calm down. Let the question continue. We will now have to rely upon Plaid Cymru MPs <laughs> to best set out how we can defend Wales. Why did you choose to let Theresa May off the hook? They don't like the slogan standing up for Wales, do they? No. Uh, it's one of the things I, I, I've noticed. And I, I thank the Leader of Plaid Cymru for reiterating our pledges, pledges that we in Welsh Labour are proud of, uh, and she will find uh, more to come in the manifesto that will be published in due course. They were promises you pledged before the last election. You should have already delivered on some of those pledges. First Minister, the reality is you have airbrushed your leader out of this campaign. You talk a lot about uh, unity, but I believe that you've airbrushed him out of this campaign because you know that Labour can't win. 
Now you want to make the election about your record, about the record of the Welsh Government. And we all know why you're doing that. And that's why most of your recycled uh, election pledges are within devolved competence. Therefore, then, if you lose this election in Wales, as many polls are suggesting that you might, does that mean this will be a verdict on you? Will it be your fault? And if you become the first Labour leader to lose Wales the first time in a hundred years, will you be prepared to take responsibility or can we expect you yet again to blame somebody else? Well, we had all this last year. We saw the result. Uh, people trust us to uh, stand up for, for Wales. We saw Plaid Cymru's results in the local elections. Very little by way of advances. Backwards in, uh, in Caerphilly. Only last week in this chamber, only last week in this chamber, the uh, member for South Wales Central was claiming he would be the leader of Cardiff Council, and they won three seats. Three seats. Uh, he is now claiming that he's not here. I know, and as I, as I, I, I recognise that, but uh, he is claiming that Cardiff West was a great victory uh, for Plaid Cymru. Well, uh, with three seats and Labour on 12, I'm more than happy to concede that victory to them if that is, the, if that is their definition of it. We have an election to fight. We'll all, as parties, put our policies uh, forward to the people of Wales. But above all else, we will be standing up for Wales. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew R. T. Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, last week in the news, First Minister, there were some serious concerns raised about the towel van report uh, and the progress being made on the reporting system around the towel van um, disaster, I'd call it, uh, where people were actually, as the previous report talked about, being treated like animals uh, and other shocking revelations, and families showing real concern over the progress that the information is coming back to them to satisfy themselves over the way their family, their loved ones were looked after. Uh, and there has been a call for the mortality report uh, to be brought forward because Betsy Cadwallader have identified that some premature deaths could be associated to the levels of care that were around the towel van unit uh, on a spuddy gland fluid. And in fact, the head of the Community Health Council in North Wales has called for this report to be made available because it has been finished. Will you, as a government, commit to making that report available, given that Betsy Cadwallader are in special measures and you are responsible for that health board? Uh, we will give full consideration to that on the uh, basis that we want to be as open as, and transparent as possible, is what people would, uh, would expect and uh, consider consideration will be given to uh, releasing that report if that's appropriate. Well, the head of the Community Health Council believes it is appropriate, uh, to use his words, so it may stop any of this bad practice appearing elsewhere. We know that report is available. It has been concluded. You are spending £5 million a year additionally running Betsy Cadwallader because it's in uh, special measures, so you are responsible. When families and concerned clinicians want to see this data so they can fully understand what went on within that unit, why on earth are you not allowing that report to come forward? Because it would add a huge amount of comfort to the families and to the individuals who have heard such horrific stories over the care within that unit. And in particular, I draw your attention to the fact that it has already been said patients were treated like animals. Well, the, uh, the report is, as I understand it, with the independent overseer, uh, and at the right time, consideration will be given to releasing the report. It's important that uh, as much information as possible is made available to those who have seen their relatives suffer and to those who have suffered in order that lessons can be learned. I'm really disappointed you're not prepared to give some firm indications of when that report will be available. As I said, this isn't a politician who's saying this report should be made available. This is the head of the Community Health Council in North Wales, along with family members and clinicians. So I'd be grateful if you're not in a position to give an indication of the timeline today, because I've just put that question to you, that you would indicate that you would write to me to allow me to have sight of the timeline that you as a government are working to. I think that's the very least that someone can expect, given the concerns that were raised last week. But also, I would ask you to confirm, are you satisfied with the level of bed capacity in North Wales for mental health patients? Because it has come to our attention that there is the sofa system that is working in North Wales, where, where bed isn't available in mental health, people are put on sofas to try and meet the targets. That cannot be right. It is putting vulnerable people in a position where they could be exploited. 
And how can anyone feel that a SOFA system meets the requirement for providing safe and secure bed capacity in the North Wales Health Board area? Well, if the uh, leader of the Welsh Conservatives has evidence of a SOFA system as he describes it, I'd be glad to see that evidence. And I will, of course, write to him along the lines uh, that he has asked for, providing him with uh, more information regarding the timescale uh, in terms of any release of the report. Leader of the UKIP Group, Neil Hamilton. The First Minister will <coughs> know that the Cabinet Secretary for Education's party is uh, standing in this Westminster election on a policy of increasing income tax for people earning as low as £11,000 a year. Um, and the Labour Party nationally is apparently going to stand on a policy of increasing the top rate of income tax from 45p to 50p. Does he agree with the Shadow Chancellor that we have a great deal to learn from Karl Marx and Das Kapital? And does he think that uh, raising the top rate of tax is likely to raise more money? Yes, I do. I think that raising the top rate of tax will raise uh, more money. Uh, I don't think that we have much to learn from uh, Das uh, Capital, for those who've read it and tried to understand what it says, which is not an easy uh, exercise. Uh, we uh, uh, stand on a platform of ensuring that those who can afford to pay a little bit more do pay a little bit more in order to ensure that we have the uh, public services that people would expect. So am I to take it from that response that it is now the policy of the Welsh Government when taxpayers are devolved to us in this assembly to follow the Labour Party's manifesto nationally of increasing the top rates of tax in Wales. Because the evidence from the last time that uh, this happened in 2013 was that uh, reducing the tax rate from 50p to the current 45p actually led to an enormous increase in revenue of about £8 billion. So, it seems to be rather counterproductive to stand on a policy which increases tax rates and actually reduces revenue and makes it less able, le le less likely that the Welsh Government will be able to put more money into the National Health Service. As far as the Welsh rate of income tax is concerned, we've already pledged that we will not uh, increase the, uh, the rate of income tax during the course of this Assembly. I'm delighted to hear that, but whether that means that the First Minister uh, accepts that raising rates doesn't necessarily lead to increasing revenue, offers Wales a great opportunity to make our country into a kind of tax haven within the United Kingdom, which would help us to, which would help us to reverse the economic trends of many, many decades in, in Wales and give us a significant advantage in the same way as Southern Ireland has used differential rates of corporation tax to kickstart the Celtic Tiger economy, which was very successful in that country. He raises an, an interesting point about corporation tax. There's no proposal to devolve uh, corporation tax. What I do know is that tax havens tend to have very poor public services. Uh, in particular, they don't have health services. Uh, because they can't raise the money in order to pay for those uh, public services. I don't believe that the future of Wales lies in being a, a kind of replica Br British Virgin Islands uh, or a, a replica necessarily of, of, the, of the Channel Islands. We have a very different model. The Channel Islands don't have, for example, uh, a, a health service along the model that we would, uh, would understand. Uh, but getting the balance right between revenue and expenditure on public services to the level that people uh, would expect is, of course, a matter for governments to balance. Question three. Question three, Julie Morgan. What is the First Minister's assessment of the current state of negotiations with the EU? Static, I think is the word that I, I'd use. Uh, there's been an, a, a tremendous sort of posturing on both sides. Uh, I hope that comes to an end pretty soon so that uh, the, uh, the task of ensuring a sensible Brexit uh, is taken forward. Um, I thank the First Minister for that response. Um, although the UK Treasury has guaranteed full funding for all European structural and investment projects that have started before the UK leaves the EU. Uh, does the First Minister agree that it is absolutely crucial that after the UK leaves the EU, that the total sum of money that has been available in the past for these projects um, in Wales is added to the Welsh budget and is under the control of the Welsh budget? I, I do. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, we know that structural funds are guaranteed for, for 2020, uh, farming subsidies guaranteed to 2020, but nothing beyond. Uh, at the moment, farmers face the, uh, the scenario where they have nothing at all in terms of support beyond that time. I have an easy answer. That's quite simply for the pot of money to be made available as it is now, for it to be distributed as it is uh, now to provide the certainty uh, that uh, structural funds provide so far, and particularly certainty for our farmers. And that's a good way of ensuring that farmers don't have to suffer as a result of Brexit. Mark Isherwood. 
Although Jeremy Corbyn has joined the Conservatives in saying he wants Brexit to deliver a fairer society and upgraded economy, we recognise there are tough negotiations ahead. How, therefore, do you respond to his uh, statement that the issue of Brexit is settled? In terms of the question, it is settled because uh, Britain is leaving the EU and that question has already been uh, answered. Uh, what I don't see, however, is any semblance of any kind of plan from the UK government. Nothing. I've sat there in meetings, I've asked, I, I've tried to, to see what the plan is, that there isn't one. Last Thursday, we saw panic on the part of the, uh, the Prime Minister when she started to worry about what Brexit would mean for ordinary working people. She's right uh, to be concerned about that. But you can't say, on the one hand, no deal is better than the bad deal, and then say, oh, but of course we need a deal to make sure that we don't see um, an economic downturn. Now, what's hugely important is that the posturing of last week goes, uh, that we have ideas as to what Brexit might look like. She was a Remainer. She was a Remainer. Let's, let's not uh, forget that. She is somebody like me who has accepted the result, and it's hugely important uh, for those who have ideas to work together to take those ideas forward, because we've had nothing at all in terms of ideas from those who uh, campaigned for Brexit. Stefan Lewis. Yorkshire, will, uh, will the First Minister agree with me that the kind of language being used by the Prime Minister to attack our friends and neighbours on the continent <laughs> helps nobody in terms of the negotiations uh, that are to come and doesn't only tarnish Theresa May's government but also threatens to tarnish the reputation of Wales and the, the First Minister is asking for ideas in going forward to mitigate the potential of tarnishing Wales's good name around the world because of that language being used by Theresa May. Will he commit to implement a new international policy for Wales which would include designating a member of his cabinet as the External Affairs Cabinet Secretary for our country in order to start rebuilding the bridges that Westminster so determined to burn down? Well, I mean, last week's language was undiplomatic. I think both sides actually were, were guilty of uh, posturing. That needs to, uh, to come to an end. This is not a war. Nobody's invaded anybody else. Uh, we're not about to uh, face each other, uh, to stare at each other over the Channel or indeed across the Irish border. Uh, we want to be friends and uh, allies and trading partners at the end of the day. We've already started to look at our international policy, in particular, uh, where we need to beef up our international uh, presence. Uh, we know we've been successful. Uh, the uh, Qatar Airways flight is another example of where Welsh Government uh, has been able to support the airport uh, to get that uh, route. Uh, but the next stage for us is to make sure that we look to uh, have, a, a, uh, su have sufficient presence and an increased presence in those markets that will become important to us. Question, Question four, Mike Hedges. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on the development of district shopping centres within cities? Well, we do promote existing uh, retail and commercial centres as the most sustainable locations for new development. And local authorities should establish land use and regeneration strategies and policies to support vibrant, viable and attractive retail and commercial centres. Thank you, First Minister. Most in Swansea, the major district shopping centre. There are other district shopping centres in Swansea and in other cities of Wales. I'd like to stress the important district shopping centres such as Morriston, Mumbles and Whitchurch in Cardiff. Uh, in Morriston, we have lost banks, public houses and shopping diversity. Will the First Minister agree with me that there should be a major bank in every one of these district shopping centres? Well, ideally, we welcome the co-location of bank branches within district shopping centres, but these are ultimately matters for the uh, banks. But it is important that businesses and customers have the ability to pay in money and make cash withdrawals within their communities. So where the banks are failing to accommodate this, we know the post office is serving an important role, with 95% of all UK banking customers having access to their bank accounts via the post office. What I'd be more concerned about if there were any announcements by the post office in the future about closing post office branches, because that removes, of course, the only banking function that remains in so many communities. Russell George. Uh, First Minister, footfall has uh, decreased in Welsh high streets. Uh, by comparison, footfall to out-of-town uh, shopping centres has increased by 4.6%, according to information from last year. Now, the Welsh Retail Consortium has called for local authorities and retailers to work uh, together to market a high street identity uh, effectively. Um, now, can I ask, um, and also they want local authorities to have more flexibility in regards to the planning system. Uh, so can I ask you, how do you think the planning system can help to uh, be more supportive to high streets? Well, we, we know that uh, it's hugely important that local authorities, when they develop their, uh, their LDPs, look at how they can assist existing retail centres, including high streets. But it's about more than that. 
It is hugely important for town centres to develop their own identity. How many town centres have a website? If I were to go to a town in Wales, uh, can I find out what's there? Is there a website? Have the traders um, got their own websites? And of course, the reason why people go to out to town shopping centres is the sheer convenience, they're open. Uh, and they, they're open particularly on Sundays when most people these days tend to shop. So it's hugely important that high street retailers look flexibly at their opening hours as well. This isn't 40 years ago when people went to shop in the week, uh, in the daytime, and shops were open. In the main, people are shopping six, seven, eight o'clock at night. They're shopping on Sundays when a lot of high streets are closed. So there needs to be some flexibility as well with traders to make sure that they, that they align their opening hours. There's a limit to what they can do as sole traders, but to align their opening hours uh, with the, the work patterns that people have now, not the work patterns people, people had, say, 30 or 40 years ago. Hugely important as well as part of the LDP process that sufficient room is given in town centres to more uh, uh, living accommodation and more office space. You have the office workers during the day, you've got the football during the day to help the retailers. Gareth Bennett. Lewis. Um, Mike Hedges um, mentioned uh, the closure of high street banks and you mentioned post offices. Another important part of uh, district shopping areas is sometimes the local pub. I wondered, uh, was there any update um, regarding the Welsh Government's talks uh, with camera, I believe, uh, about how to protect community pubs? I have to declare interest as a camera member at this point. Uh, the, it's a tricky issue because we know that it, 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 in planning terms, it's not difficult to change the use of a pub to another uh, commercial or retail use. Uh, that said, of course, quite often pubs uh, are not sold and they become derelict because they're empty uh, after a while. Uh, so it's not an easy issue to resolve. We, we know, even Camera itself recognises there are still too many pubs, uh, given people's uh, current uh, social uh, habits. What's hugely important is to be able to work with um, the, those, the market-leading pubs, there are many of them, some small, some big, in order to provide a good example to, uh, to others. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it's a question of ensuring that the pubs are able to offer the widest range of services possible to customers. I've been to countries where the pubs double up the shops. Well, Wales, actually. I think Cumdi is one example where, where the pub is also, in Ethnodale, where the pub is also a shop. So looking at ways in which pubs can also act as business hubs in communities where the local shop can be, possibly the post office, and that's one way forward to ensure the pubs have a viable future. Question Pimp, Vicky Howells. Sorry, Vicky Holt. Will the First Minister outline the actions the Welsh Government is taking to improve the mental health of people in Wales? Well, together for mental health, our cross-government mental health strategy and the related 2016 rather, to 19 delivery plan sets of our priorities for improving the mental health and well-being of people in Wales. Thank you. Two weeks ago, I was proud to speak alongside the Health Secretary at the first year celebrations of Valley Steps, a community project which seeks to improve emotional well-being through mindfulness and stress control courses. Now, Valley Steps has helped nearly 2,000 people during their first year, and Mental Health Awareness Week seems an appropriate time to celebrate their success. With one in four people experiencing mental health issues, what best practice can the Welsh Government draw from Valley Steps and promote amongst other health boards across Wales? Well, Valley Steps is an innovative approach. It aims to improve mental health and reduce antidepressant prescribing. And I do congratulate them on reaching their first anniversary. And we are keen to spread the word of innovative models uh, such as this to encourage similar collaboration to support people with mental health uh, problems. And that work then will inform, of course, new uh, initiatives, including the development of the wellbeing bond and the social prescribing uh, pilots. So we'll consider uh, the work of organisations such as Valley's Steps uh, in order to ensure that uh, what we are doing is strengthened as a result of looking at their experience. Angela Burns. Um, First Minister, a number of deaths by suicide have occurred in the recent past in schools in my constituency. Now, um, uh, earlier this year, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom um, made an announcement that every secondary school in England should be offered mental health first aid training, which teaches people how to identify young people who might be uh, developing a mental health issue. And this policy has been very well received by charities and professionals. Especially, and we must remember, that many young people do, um, <clears throat> do struggle with issues such as anorexia and self-harming, as well as suicidal thoughts. And I just wondered, First Minister, if you might consider a similar initiative to go on in our schools to try to prevent these uh, wasteful deaths. Well, I, I did note the Prime Minister's announcement recently, which, which talked about having somebody in every school in England and Wales. 
I know that was a mistake on her part, uh, and the idea behind what she suggested is one worthy of examination. But of course, what I uh, would remind the member of is we have a councillor in, in every secondary school in Wales already uh, able to provide that service. I think the, the trick is not just to provide the councillor, but to ensure that young people feel able to go and see that councillor. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a more difficult nut to crack. Yes. Uh, actually going to see somebody and people maybe finding out, even though it's, it's confidential, young people see it that way, that, that can be quite, uh, quite a step for them as well. So we, we already have the councillors in schools, but that's, that's, that's not enough of itself. We also need to make sure, of course, that the young people are able to access assistance outside school uh, as well, particularly in an environment where they feel comfortable. Thank you, Llywydd. Does the First Minister truly understand how much of a crisis there is facing us in terms of mental health care in Wales? In Anismorn, I understand that there is now not a single psychiatric consultant for mental health patients between 18 and 65 years old. Health professionals are working under huge pressures that they can't cope with. They fear that they are having to make decisions which will be a risk to patients. The shortage of beds means that people are taken as far as London to be treated or receive care. There are dozens of children and young people who are sent to England for treatment and over 200 mental health patients in North Wales have been transferred out of Wales in the last 22 months. Now, the whole system is on its knees. When will the government take action in order to safeguard some of my most vulnerable constituents? I do not accept the figures that the member has listed in the chamber. First of all, the funding for mental health has gone up to 629 million for the ensuing financial year, and that is safeguarded. Health boards have attained and actually exceeded their targets as regards mental health services in some areas over the past 12 months. And of course, although more people are transferred into CALMS, the health boards are confident that the situation will demonstrate that every CALMS service in every part of Wales attained the 28-day target before they get a new appointment. And so very many improvements have uh, taken place over the past months. In six, David Alice Thomas. Thank you, Llywydd. When will the First Minister meet with the First Ministers of the UK's other devolved governments to discuss their relationship with the European Union? Well, of course, there is business to be discussed between, before, the, uh, before the 8th of June interfered at the moment, but I do discuss EU issues with, um, in bilateral and trilateral meetings with First Ministers of Scotland and Northern Ireland and the Deputy First Ministers of uh, Northern Ireland. Wouldn't the First Minister agree that these tripartite discussions are more important than ever, given what's contained within this white paper with a sky blue cover on exiting the European Union produced by the UK government, which mentions the situation post Brexit that the powers that the UK that the EU currently has in terms of common frameworks will return to the UK, allowing the rules to be set there by democratically elected members. What's happening to us in this place? How are our views in the devolved administrations to be part of those discussions? Well, my view is that those powers should come to the people of Wales and shouldn't be retained in Westminster or Whitehall. It's crucial to have frameworks in some parts, such as the fisheries, for example, but those frameworks should actually be agreed and not imposed upon people without their consent. We must remember that if we're going to have a single market within the UK, and I, we agree with that, we have to have rules. But if we don't have ownership of the rules, nobody's going to pay any attention to them. And secondly, there is the question who's going to police those rules without having a court of law to refer to. Some people in the UK think we'll move back to how things were pre-1972, but that isn't the same United Kingdom that we have now. We don't have just one government uh, by now and there's a great deal of work to be done to ensure that these powers will be transferred from Brussels to Wales and not via London.
Uh, when the um, External Affairs Committee visited Brussels last year, we met with the Canadian trade delegation, and I was struck by the role of the Canadian provinces in the negotiation and approval of the CETA deal with the European Union. We also know, of course, since then, of the role of the Wallonian Parliament in approving uh, the deal. Uh, trade negotiations with the EU, and indeed beyond, are going to become increasingly important for Wales and the UK. And they're much more than about foreign affairs and crown prerogative. They're about the bread and butter issues of daily economic life. So does he agree with me that future trade negotiations, both with the EU and beyond, should include a voice for Wales and the other devolved administrations in the negotiation and approval of those agreements, which are so fundamental to our economic well-being? Yes, I do. Even though trade, of course, per se is not uh, devolved, it's hugely important that we have a strong voice because we may be called on to implement uh, the results of any uh, trade agreement, uh, even though we might uh, virulently oppose uh, any particular part of a trade uh, agreement. So that is hugely important. So, for example, if there were to be a free trade agreement with New Zealand or Australia, that would have a massive impact on our farmers. Now, even though that's not devolved, I'm sure nobody would argue rationally that somehow we have no locus uh, in uh, putting forward a, a view uh, in that regard. We, we heard you know, voices from Australia over the last few weeks saying that it was not possible to have a free trade agreement with Australia and protect the interests of our shale farmers. Well, th that I know, because if we have a, a free trade agreement in terms of agriculture, uh, then for many of our Welsh hill farmers, they will have no future. And so it is hugely important that the Welsh Government and this Assembly is able to express a very strong view and influence and reject, actually, part or parts of trade agreements that would have a hugely adverse impact on our own farmers. Stefan Lewis. Okay, the issue raised by the member for Dwyer Mirionad is, is crucial and it's been identified for several months now that the future governance of the UK's internal market uh, will, have, uh, an will give an indication of the future of the constitution of this country. So can I ask the First Minister what progress has he made in terms of persuading his counterparts in Scotland and Northern Ireland to agree that the future UK internal market should be governed jointly by the nations of the UK and should not be imposed upon us by Whitehall? There are differing views amongst the governments. Um, the, the view in Scotland is basically, well, independence will resolve the issue. Uh, the view in Northern Ireland is, is, is mixed. Uh, certainly, I, I know or I've heard the former First Minister of Northern Ireland say there should be any state aid rules at all. Uh, now, we have to come to a position, which I think is perfectly reasonable, where we all say where powers are transferred back from Brussels, they come to the devolved administrations. I see no reason why that can't be agreed. And any the First Minister of Scotland is in agreement with me on that. Uh, so we're in the same position. My view is, uh, and I've not heard a voice dissenting from this, that if we are to have an internal single market, the rules have to be agreed and they have to be uh, policed by an independent adjudication body, not by the UK government. How can the UK government police it anyway? If we decide to ignore them, there's nothing they can do. Now, that's in nobody's interest. We have to have a clear system. We have to have faith in a system that is seen as genuinely independent, not as we have now in the JMC dispute resolution process, where if there is a dispute between ourselves and the UK Treasury, ultimately it is resolved by the UK Treasury. You know, those days have to go. This can be done perfectly sensibly and perfectly properly in order to safeguard the interests of Wales. Question Scythe. Question 7, Stefan Lewis. Minister, make a statement on pupil and student safety on foreign field trips. Yes, up-to-date advice for trips is produced by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. That advice is also signposted uh, in the All Wales Guidance for Education Visits, written by uh, Outdoor Education Advisors Panel for Wales and the Health and Safety Executive, and that is accessible from the Welsh Government's website. On several occasions, I've implored upon the Government to intervene further in the case of Glyn Summers, who lost his life on a foreign college trip to Spain. Glyn's parents, with great dignity, have demanded full transparency in terms of the woeful in investigation that followed uh, their son's death, and they believe that there should be an automatic right to an independent investigation in such circumstances. In his last letter to me on this matter, the First Minister said he did not believe there is anything further uh, that he can do with regards to their concerns. But since then, the Public Services Ombudsman has found that the investigation into Glyn's death was flawed. The Ombudsman has called on the local authority to apologise to Glyn's parents and has further called on the Welsh Government to review its policies further. Will the First Minister say sorry and will he reconsider his opposition to the right to a full and independent investigation into death and serious injuries on foreign field trips? Well, the moment misrepresents the position that, that, that I gave. First of all, it was a, an awful uh, event that occurred, and it's been a, a, a very hugely difficult uh, few years, as we can all imagine, uh, for, uh, for Glenn's uh, parents. 
Uh, the matter has rested with the, the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman has now reported. There are recommendations for us as a government, and we will, of course, take those recommendations exceptionally seriously. Uh, the issue for me was, was there anything else that we could do as a government uh, that would add to what the Ombudsman has already found as part of his investigations? I will keep that as an open question. Uh, because I think these things have to be looked at uh, hugely carefully. And as a result of the Ombudsman's uh, findings, uh, I look uh, once again to see whether there's anything more uh, that can be done uh, following the, uh, the report itself. Heaven, David. Um, I'd like to echo Stephen Lewis's concerns and, uh, and also offer my condolences to the, the family of Glyn Summers. Um, I, th I think the, the question is, how can the Welsh Government ensure that schools are able to reflect on occurrences, those rare occurrences when something adverse happens on uh, uh, school trips? And um, the First Minister said he'd keep it as an open question. Would he be willing to elaborate on how schools can learn from each other in these circumstances? Well, the Ombudsman's uh, recommendation is that, is that he will invite us as a government to consider reviewing our policies and guidance in respect of educational visits uh, abroad. As part of that process of review, uh, it's hugely important to understand where the best practice lies, to consult once again with the Outdoor Education Advisors panel in order to make sure that the recommendation that the uh, Ombudsman has uh, put to us uh, is satisfied in full. Darren Miller. So if, uh, I share the concerns which have already been um, uh, expressed in the Chamber and, uh, of course, the sympathy uh, to the family of Glyn Summers. But would you agree with me, First Minister, that we need to get the balance right uh, here in respect of any changes that might need to be made going forward to improve uh, the risk and uh, risk assessment uh, processes regarding uh, school trips? Because we do want people to be able to access uh, an enriched educational experience by taking part uh, in trips. So it's important that any changes to Welsh Government guidance, any local education authority guidance, or indeed any regional consortia guidance, uh, is something which doesn't prohibit trips from taking place, uh, and that it's fair and proportionate uh, to all those taking part. Yeah, I, I couldn't disagree uh, with, with the words that the member has used, but in, in these circumstances, there has been a death. It's hugely important yeah. that there is as much transparency as possible. There's as much, uh, as much information as possible is used in order to strengthen policies as far as the, the, the future is, uh, is concerned. But, but yes, of course, uh, nobody would want to see a situation where um, school trips don't take place because of what I've seen as uh, uh, regulations that are overly burdensome, but it is important in the circumstances that we've outlined today uh, that, that a, a full investigation leads to a full set of uh, recommendations uh, in order to minimise, we can never remove risk, it's impossible, life is not like that, but to minimise uh, any potential risk in the future. Question Oith, Michelle. Question 8, Michelle Brown. Presiding officer, following the enactment of the Wales Act 2017, what further powers should be devolved to Wales? Those powers are to be found in our Draft Government and Laws in Wales Bill, which we published. Okay, thank you for your answer. I note that earlier you pledged not to increase income tax during the term of this Assembly, but will you also pledge to use your devolved powers to reduce cost to businesses so that employers can start being attracted to Wales and providing much needed jobs? I'm not sure what powers she's referring uh, to. Many of the issues she refers to are, are not devolved. Business rates are, that's true. But in terms of issues such as national insurance or corporation tax, they are, they are not devolved. Uh, we know we'll see some devolution of income tax in the course of the, uh, of the coming uh, year. But from our perspective, we have a very good record. Uh, we have an employment that's lower than England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And of course, we've just uh, recently had the best uh, figures for foreign direct investment for 30 years. Nick Ramsey. Minister, as Michelle Brown has just said, the uh, Wales Act, the current legislation, will of course deliver a range of new fiscal powers for the Welsh Government, range from borrowing to uh, income tax powers and, and stamp duty. Whatever you want to do with those taxes in the future, whether you want to leave them where they are, raise them or lower them, will be dependent on a strong Welsh Revenue Authority. And that's currently in the process of being set up, and the Finance Committee has been looking at that. Are you happy with the progress being made with the development of that authority? And what mechanisms do you have in place to make sure that that progress keeps on track? Because it's clearly vitally important. We have no concerns about the progress of the Welsh Revenue uh, Authority. Um, we know that it will be in place in good time for, uh, for next year. Of course, we need to ensure that uh, when taxes are devolved, there's an authority in place to make sure those taxes can be collected. We've understood that there is a pressure on government, uh, and that pressure we have uh, met. Uh, and uh, we're confident that uh, when the time comes uh, next year, the Welsh Revenue Authority uh, will be in place and ready to start its work. Dai Lloyd. <coughs> uh, will you... 
Myself from comments made by Diane Abbott, MP, um, Labour's Shadow Home Secretary, uh, who told uh, BBC Radio Wales last week that the Labour Party did not think it was, quote, right at this time to devolve policing to Wales. Um, have you asked Diane Abbott why she feels that the Welsh Government, um, uniquely, is uh, less capable than the Scottish and Northern Ireland executives in terms of delivering police services? The Welsh Government packed full of uh, Labour elected representatives, as I'm sure you're aware, whereas in fact the Scottish and Northern Ireland executives have no such lumber encumbrances. Uh, I'm fully aware of the fact that the people of Wales decided that there should be a Labour-led government in Wales last year. Thank, I thank him for reminding me of that. I, I do not agree that policing shouldn't be devolved. Policing should be devolved. There is a debate in this chamber uh, tomorrow afternoon when they, the issue will become clear in terms of the way that, uh, that, that votes uh, occur. There is no reason at all, not, uh, not at all, why uh, policing should be devolved to Scotland and Northern Ireland, should be devolved to Manchester, to London, but not to Wales. There, there, is no, there is no rational reason for that to be the case. We know that there will need to be cooperation uh, in terms of counter-terrorism. There are some issues that need to be dealt with at the UK level. When it comes to community policing, why is it that Wales is seen as a second-class nation by the Tories? Thank you, First Minister.